I don't know if you can separate thought from matter. Apparently, you can separate consciousness from matter. There's plenty of people who experience leaving their body uh, in one form or another, right? So, so you, you you can separate something that we call consciousness or something from matter. Uh, but but uh, so why study light at all is because there's somehow that is that's like the meeting place. That's that's the best we have. Things like light and electricity are the best toolbox, things in our toolbox that we have as currently educated scientists. That's the closest thing we have to what our thoughts and what our feelings and what is consciousness. Michael Claridge. Dr. Michael Claridge of the Sapphire Project, of the Ronin Institute, and of michaelclaridge.substack.com is here to talk about everything from the electrical nature of stars to the ability of nuclear transmutation to get rid of radioactive waste to the nature of science to the role of morphogenic fields in biology and the perplexing way that light affects everything that happens inside of us. I don't think I can add anything to that. This is a fantastic conversation. I think you guys are going to love it. Remember to support us on Patreon. We really need your help to keep this project going and enjoy the conversation. The scientific revolution starts now. The Sapphire Project is, um, it, it conti- we're continuing our, our original uh, research direction of understanding how electricity might play itself out in the cosmos around us, specifically electricity involved with solar activity. What are, what are the aspects of stars that are electrical? So we're still continuing that. It's just that our, um, since our process, our research also has led us into transmutation, where we're turning elements into other elements. Uh, we, we are also looking at um, how we can use that to help, <laughs> other ways we can use that to help the world. And one of the big problems, as a lot of people know, is problems with radioactivity, radioactive waste, radioactivity, fracking water. And, and so we are we're turning our, uh, also turning our attention towards how to commercialize that uh, it's it, it's such a huge need. The more I've learned about it in the last couple of years, it is just uh, like a lot of things, a shock when you realize how bad the problem is, like how, how much we are literally destroying our drinking water. And and uh, and I haven't seen much. You don't see a whole lot of, of press, a whole lot of uh, activity around people who are who are, you know, providing solutions for that. Uh, so, so we're also also do, I'm just saying we're also doing that. We're also going in the direction of how to commercialize uh, a way to clean up some of the radioactivity problems we have in our current in our current world. Where's all this radioactive sludge coming from? Is this uh, what's the origins of that from a scientific perspective? It's quite fascinating. So the fracking is you shoot a slurry of stuff down into the wells, down into the oil fields. And then that pressure, that added stuff and pressure, brings up a bunch of stuff from under the ground. And, and a lot of what it brings up is the oil and the natural gas, which is why it's, it's done. But it also brings up, you, you, you know those uh, the scenes in the, I love these scenes in the Lord of the Rings trilogy when they go down under the earth, you know? And, and there's that scene where they're in the, in the dwarf hold and, and they all and it's all all they've all died they've all been destroyed and someone says something like but the dwarfs dug too deep yeah. <laughs> the mines of, i think it's the right? mines of moria yeah like after they meet the balrog yeah something like that right and so what comes up part of what comes up from the deep is radioactivity and i've learned in the last couple of years that but just not very far below our surface, just a few thousand feet down, uh, radioactivity is is a natural. It's everywhere. Uh, there is something. There's something that that the Earth needs it for. There is some reason why it's down there, and we have no idea what that reason is. But there's a lot of it down there, 
And it's just elements turning into other elements. Uh, it's, it's a lot of these heavy elements, the cesiums, the iodines, the radiums. You, are you familiar with uh, Marvin Herndon's georeactor core model, by any chance? Oh, of, of how the Earth stays warm, that kind of thing? Uh, he, has a, he has a really interesting model for how various elements are transmuted and how that's actually an energetic process within the core and contributes to the uh, stability and generation of the magnetic field. Um, I'm, I'm afraid I'm not able to steel man him beyond that right now, but it's quite yeah. fascinating. We did a podcast with him and most of the podcast was about uh, the, the crustal dynamics. So we didn't, we, we might do another one about the georeactor, but it's quite a fascinating idea. Um, there are a number of inconsistencies with the current model for a lot of these radioactive species as they're appearing, um, the presence of certain helium isotopes and things like that. So, yeah, it'd be interesting. I'm also really interested in the presence of radioactive species from a dating perspective, because all of our dating methods seem to depend upon uh, the assumption that all of the fresh uranium was established at the moment of the inception of the solar system. Right. Um, and so I, I've always been a little suspicious of that claim. Um, so, yeah, it will be On the basis that if your novel uranium is being made in the georeactor? Yeah, if it's being dislodged, right, if it's being protected somehow because it's bound in a chemical fashion such that it can't decay until it's released. Um, I'm just very interested about uh, where this uh, these radioactive species are appearing from because usually... Obviously, uh, the largest element um, is decaying into the smaller ones, and some of those are radioactive, and it's a big, long chain of appearance of these species. What, what species are found in the fracking water? Yeah, good question. It, yeah, it's a lot, and it depends upon where you are. So mm -hmm. different parts of the Earth have different types of radioactive elements below the surface. There's some that seem to show up everywhere with the oil fields, like radium, shows up seems to show up almost everywhere but I, there's there's various reports put out by the oil and gas industry and there's quite a, 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 dozens there's dozens of different ones um that are in different places and different concentrations and so is volcanic magma also radioactive oh that's a great question i don't know I, i'm not i'm not, I'm not sure question. either yeah because because i wonder because i as far as i understand it magma chambers tend to be closer to the surface than thousands of feet down, but I'm not, I'm not exactly sure what the depth of fracking is relative to the magma chamber. And the dynamics there are a little bit strange too, because it can come from a deeper place. And we actually, it's fascinating that you, that you mentioned radioactivity at these depths, because we have a conversation lined up in the next few weeks with uh, Karen Lloyd, who studies the deep hot biosphere. And so there's a layer of of never before discovered microbial life that lives yes. at the depth of thousands of feet. Yes. And <laughs> it's living with exposure to large amounts of radiation, if this is the case. And so that creates a completely new paradigm for us to be thinking about stuff because it's these, you know, yeah. perhaps millennia old bacteria, individual bacteria that are thousands of years old. And they potentially have some really unique metabolic processes too uh, that are, you know, potentially electric in nature. Well, I guess all mitochondrial processes are electric in nature, but um, yeah, their substrates are, are rocks to some extent. Yeah, so they're, they're called uh, chemolithoautotrophs, and so they're basically capable of, of breathing the rocks that are down there. Yeah, yeah. I, I remember coming across that several years ago, and the, the one paper I read at the beginning in the intro or something, they said something like, you know, even a rough estimate shows that there, there, are, more cell, there are more cells, more creatures, you know, in this bio, in that under, subterranean biosphere than are above the biosphere, if you, if you just count you know, numbers of bacteria. I didn't check their calculations, but just again, this idea that, oh, wow, like maybe there's just an enormous, an enormous part of life on earth is inside underneath the rocks. And life on other planets too, right? It, it really opens uh -huh. the door to what we should be looking for when we're going out and uh, undertaking these astrobiological ventures. But so in terms of the cleaning of radioactive waste, you say that the plan is to, trans to, to change these radioactive elements into something that is not radioactive. And that emerges from the work that you've done on the Sapphire Project. Are you, are you kind of able to talk about how that works? Or is that... 
crossing into trade secrets. <laughs> yeah, that's definitely crossing. Into trade <laughs> no worries. <laughs> I, I wanted to go back to something you mentioned. I will say, I will say so I, I, to that point, what I'm very what, part of the reason I'm very encouraged. The team is all very different. We all really, honestly, have different thoughts about this. We're not some unified hive mind or whatever. We're very independent. And, and so I'm encouraged by what I've seen in, the, in our data and other people's data that nature wants wants to help on this one. Nature actually would prefer if 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 you somehow put cesium up on the surface of the earth where it's not supposed to be. Uh, well, there, there, there's ways that are you know easy, not easy, but there, but nature wants to help you along to turn it into things like you know lead and and tungsten and helium and stuff like that. That you're not fighting this very difficult battle. You know when when you when you look at the question and what's the problem? I want to solve the problem. You, you find you're not fighting this enormous you know uphill battle. Like it's a downhill entropic situation essentially that you would stabilize these elements they there's it takes a lot of uh it takes a lot of energy to bind them into these unstable nuclei and they kind of want to come apart anyways on the on the subject of these unstable nuclei and bringing them into tungsten and lead is this a is is the yield sufficiently large to be able to produce raw materials for industry great question <laughs> Trade secrets again. <laughs> all right, all right. I, I want right. to go back to uh, you mentioned something offhand about the electric nature of stars, and this is a whole other side project we have going on on the show where we're we've talked to all of these different folks, a lot of NASA people. We have more NASA people coming on. We have uh, more astronomers from the Academy. Um, one that we'll be releasing this next week about brown dwarfs with uh, Gaibar Basri, and. Nobody has adequately explained to me the electric nature of stars, and I'm really curious if you wouldn't, if you could, you know, give us a few words about what is known and what is what are the gaps in understanding and yeah, what's that process all about? Yeah, and, and it's a very complicated subject, uh, which is part of the problem. It really is because a lot of us are looking for some simpler handholds, right, on on, on the whole thing. Uh, but you might remember, remember, do you remember a time when, when we, when, in the, I mean, in, in his in history of science, when we didn't think that the earth was electrical, like, like we didn't think that there was, that the aurora were electrical phenomena. And we didn't know that there were like 13 current systems. Now we know there's 13 electric current systems around the earth, you know, just the earth. Uh, so there's this, this kind of this slow kind of realization of, not we had it completely wrong. Not only were we, were we wrong that the Earth is not electrical, but we had it like phenomenally wrong in the sense of it's so it's so complicated that it, it it's just staggering how complicated the electrical process of the Earth is. So on stars, one one of the big hangups always was just this this complete dismissal or or denying that stars could have any electrical nature to them, right? Uh, which is a little strange because a lot of the evidence always from the beginning, you're seeing very strong magnetic fields on stars and on the surfaces of stars. You have the solar flares. Uh, and, and it was kind of like grudgingly admitted, well, okay, yes, there's magnetic fields, okay. But they're not really doing anything and they certainly don't come from electric currents. <laughs> and so this went on for many, many decades. And, uh, and these pro the, the proposed currents are are linking up different stars to one another, or what? Where are these? Okay, so, yeah. I'll, okay, so I'll, right, I'll, I'll, I'll just give me another minute. I will no come to that. So yeah, and so now at least you know there's more of an uh, of an allowance and an understanding that um, that stars have a lot of electrical aspects to them, a lot of current flows that are on the surface and in and out of the surface. Um, charge separations, uh, and so that kind of prejudice, or um, it's almost like a, it's almost like a dogma. That kind of dogma that stars cannot be electrical in any way is certainly being eroded, and so now that that's cool. But then what you came to, I think, is really just that. That's the main sticking point. It's like okay, but when you know, 
are, are, is that whole electrical nature, is it causing anything like fundamental that we know about stars? So, so for example, is the star electrically powered? Is that what you're saying? Are you proposing that stars are electrically powered? Is that what you're saying? Uh, and yeah, a lot of, uh, in, in the electric universe community for the last 50, 60, 70 years, yeah, that has been the, that that's, is a proposal on the table that stars are, that the, that the energy from the star is um, the photosphere, the, the, the surface we see that's giving off all that energy is an electrical discharge. And that the, 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 uh, the, that it's plugged into, the star is plugged into a galactic level of electrical energy or other energies that we haven't discovered yet. I don't think anybody in their right mind would say we've discovered, you know, all possible sources of energy, right? But but that, the idea, the, the picture is still good that the stars are plugged in. This is sort of, you think, in contrast to the thermonuclear concept that there's this crushing aspect that powers? The... Exactly, you know? Well, I'm just it's, asking it's if this is in contrast to that or if it integrates that or... Yeah, because what like one thing that's really fascinating is the more more people we're talking to, who are sort of established astronomers, they seem to really be opening up to this kind of discussion. Well, it's interesting because they open up to it only upon being pried a little bit, right? Because you ask like, how does a star form? And the first conversation is always like, well, gas collapses, and you're like, okay. Maybe, sure. But what else happens? And they're like, well, there's some chemistry. There's and you're some like, flakes of stuff flying around right. already. And then you're like, okay, and what else is there? And they're like, well, there's maybe some magnetism. And you're like, and what else is there? And they're like, well, maybe there's some electricity. And so it's there, but for some reason there's this deep-seated resistance. And it almost feels to me like an immune reaction. Like... Yeah. There is this. Th there seems to be some kind of fundamental cleavage where there can't be a conversation between the people who are like, "Hey, there's obviously electrical stuff going on," and the people who are like, "No, no, no, it's total. It's gravity mostly, and the electrical stuff is incidental." And my yeah. question is like, do the how do those fit together? I guess to follow up on what what Shiloh was asking. Yeah, yeah, they certainly fit together if you look locally. So if you just look at the at the sun and and kind of not look past the star. Um, I think that that will be a place where the where the conversation can really take place, and we can you know we can actually say things like, if there if you see changing magnetic fields uh, or even many magnetic fields, there have to be electric currents. This whole notion of what are they called like primordial magnetic fields? They have a name for it, like that somehow way back at the birth of the star is where the electric, the magnetic fields formed, and then they've just kind of been unfolding and churning since then, right? Just complete nonsense. Uh, so, so what I'm gonna say is that they, they can meet there if you just look locally. I, 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 don't, I don't know how we can have a smooth transition to a paradigm which says that the electricity is coming from, in some sense, coming from the galactic level. Mm, so it's like a chicken or egg. Uh, uh, argument essentially like which is first oh totally right mm -hmm. that the, the, the gravity paradigm wa wants to say that the gravity causes everything and then you know the, plus, then do the fusion gravity plus fusion that causes everything else right yeah you know i think in, in my in my cosmology uh we live in a living universe mm. we do not live in a dead universe me too me too and yeah. I think a lot of people would agree with that. And I don't know how it happens. This is one of my real questions. I study a lot of the history of science and I'm kind of trying to find out like, where did that ever, where did that ever enter people's minds that we live in a dead universe, right? I, it's, I, it's very strange because we found very quickly uh, when we were coming up through the academy that as soon as we, we were working in the context of biology, I was doing biophysics, Anastasia is doing microbial communication. We found very quickly that any questions about function at a fundamental level would kick down to the physicists. And it always seemed like a strange uh, concession to make. And there's also a cap on the size of the questions that you could ask as well, because the idea that you would attempt to talk about life or, or, or what is life or what does it mean for something to be alive or where does life begin or where does life stop? Absurd. 
right? And then you, you look at fundamental and cosmological physics, and they have so many unanswerable questions, which if you were asking similar questions from a physical perspective about a living being, you'd never be able to answer them, right? Like, what did I? Why did I decide to do what I did this morning? Dark you know, I, I went out and worked in the shop for a little, and I was sawing things and building stuff. But like, it ha- didn't have anything to do with my survival or anything. I was actually building a uh, guitar pedal board, just so you know. <laughs> oh, nice. yeah. yeah. So, um, but that's the thing. It was a motivational issue, right? It's spiritual or mental or psychological or something. Yeah. And and if we ignore those forces in the universe at yeah. scale and at fundamentality, uh, it just seems like a crazy mistake to make. I, I completely agree. It's a crazy mistake. And why would any why and why would anybody argue with you about it? Why would someone say, "Well, you can't prove that the star, the sun is alive"? I mean, where where does that? Like you were saying, Anastasia, like an immune immune reaction. It's like something in that person rises up and must shut down that thread of thought. And you know, I think that's like a, a huge part of the purpose of this project that we're undertaking here, which is to really try to to calm that. Uh, to soothe, we want to be the uh, the corticosteroid for the scientific community. <laughs> Tamp right, down it seems the, totally uh, unnecessary. Response. It's just more polarization, <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah. Um, so I, I noticed. Go ahead. Yeah, sure. I wanted to bring it back then to this question of the how would you expand the the conversation, the discussion to well, is electricity is it is it beyond the star, right? Okay, so a- any. I guess even if you don't call it life, but I don't know why you wouldn't call it life, that we live in a living universe and all living things have to eat and poop. It's just like stuff has to come in. You have to, you have to transform it. You got to use it. And then it's got to go away. Right. And, and, and without that fundamental understanding of how the universe works, then yeah, a lot of processes that would take place in an atmosphere of a planet or you know, in the in the magnetosphere of planet, you're kind of flying blind. You're like, oh, I don't know, I don't know why this is happening. It just, you know, somehow it just appears, right? Uh, and, and, but 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 on the other hand, if you have in the back of your mind that you know you're dealing with a living system, then you can ask so much more intelligent questions. You can get to the heart of matter so much more quickly. And so stars, all this time in the old paradigm, stars are isolated. Gravi- the gravity paradigm, each star is on its own. It's an incredibly lonely universe in the gravity model, right? And that's one of the reasons why I know it's all it's wrong is because it's it, it, that's not how living systems work, right? And so li- stars, like any living systems, have to be they have to be um, exchanging uh, with each other things, which we don't know much about yet. They have to be eating, whatever that means for a star. They have to be um, transforming stuff that they bring in for their own sustenance and their own activities. And yeah, you bet they have motivations. You were saying a little while ago, Michael, about, you know, there's motivations involved with with activity. And we know that about ourselves. And we're willing to say it's true about raccoons and rats and microbes and stuff. But heaven forbid you would bring up the idea that the star or planet has motivations, right? And to me, but to me, it's obvious. We actually had a NASA scientist on the show the other day, David Grinspoon, who wrote a paper. Uh, you probably saw it with Sarah Walker and was it Adam Frank about planetary scale intelligence. And it was funny because we're like, okay, well, let's. We were talking about the Gaian hypothesis, a pretty strong one, where it's a, you know, it's an organism essentially. The planet is an organism, and we're like, well, you know, you don't really see organisms existing in isolation. There must be a community of such, or if it's an organism, we must accept that there's a community of such organisms and that it's highly likely they're in communication with one another or there's some social aspect to it. It's hard to imagine even a bacterium without some primitive social capacity. But we, but we do have a tendency to, to ignore these community and awareness aspects. Like I saw an article the other day that was like, dogs have similar emotions to humans, scientists discover. And I'm just like, <laughs> Come on, guys. And you're like wow, that you could, you, someone got paid, someone got paid to to research that. Wow. And not only that, but they, I guarantee you that they went to conferences for decades where people were like, no, they don't. <laughs> and it's you know fish don't feel pain plants can't communicate to each other like i've i have a lot of vegan and vegetarian friends and i've i've tried to kind of toss this ball into their court where i'm like hey why do you think that a 
a tomato plant that is in indentured servitude to humans to produce these gargantuan mutated fruits is suffering any less than the cow. And they're like, well, plants don't feel things the way that mammals do. And it's, and it's such deep-seated certainty that it, it is not at all surprising to me that the exact same certainty extends to stars, where people are like, well, if we can't even extend that to, to fish and to tomato yeah. plants, how can we possibly extend it to stars? Yeah. It, it yeah. like lives somewhere. I, I want to add that I think a lot of it has to do with the conservative nature of the academy to some extent, right? I, I, there was a really fascinating blog that I found on your, uh, what was it, on your Substack? Mm-hmm. And uh, you were you were talking about how difficult, th- you were talking about the difficulties in detecting these uh, magnetic fields at cosmic scale because, uh, and, and you can correct me if I don't, I probably don't understand this very well, but you were describing the coaxial nature of these currents as they travel. And so essentially from the outs, you have layers. Yeah, Anastasia has pulled it up here. Uh, especially we can observe this coming into the poles of the earth, I guess, from what I understand. Yep. And so, yeah, what's the trouble? Why is it so hard to detect this stuff in space? Yeah, yeah, it has it has to do with the with the fact that the the coaxial nature. So, so current is flowing through a plasma. It's the easiest model, easiest picture. You have current throwing, flowing through plasma, and the and and the and plasmas are very uh, responsive, very easy. They, they can change. You know, they they can they can adapt themselves very quickly to 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 um, lower energy structures, higher energy structures. And so if you if you put current through a plasma, it there's this natural process, which one can work through the math and one can see it in laboratory experiments, where the current, um, the, it's really strange, the current flows in a main, a main center coil, a main center direction is where the current flows. But then that right away, that produces or is associated with a return current. So now you have a return current coming back around the one that you that, that is the main current. And not only is it just going down and back, but they start to twist and spin. And it's a smooth transition. So you have a twisting, spinning main current, which as you move outward radially, starts to actually twist back the other way and head back the other way. And if you have enough current flowing, then it will form another layer where then that layer starts to twist back the way, it, uh, back in the direction of the, um, of the primary current. And so you get this, you get this coaxial, the sheath, sheaths within sheaths, and the magnetic fields that are produced by all that current flow tend to cancel each other out. If it was just a single, current flowing through the plasma, it would have a very strong, you know, circular magnetic field around it. That would just be simple physics. And you, you could see it. it would be like, but, you know, there's, there's the, 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 the magnetic field going around your current flow. But as uh, so I was just saying this, the way that current flows more naturally in a natural plasma setting, the return currents then are, have everything opposite about them. So they actually cancel out the magnetic fields from the one, inside of them. So that's where it becomes very difficult. And so the paper you were looking at there, I was just going through the, you know, just the the basic math in the sense of, well, given, let's assume that's true, that you have this coaxial return current back and forth, everything's canceling out. There's got to be something left over. And what would be left over? What what would be the remaining signature magnetically uh, of all of that? So that's what that paper is about. Uh, I've discussed the galactic magnetic field with folks, and it's often argued that, well, it's so weak, it could never accomplish anything. And if there is local process, if there are local processes that are being obscured uh, in this, uh, this summation model, uh, that's, that's yeah. really some interesting food for thought for me. It is. It is really good. Yeah. Did, you, did you have a conclusion about what that magnetic signature is? Yeah, so if if you're looking at that part, that blog part there, yeah, I, I I have a couple of figures where I show what is what is the sum total, uh, and it's it's not. Uh, I, I guess I don't remember if I if I calculated what percentage of, of of it would be. I mean, how much weaker is it than what you would expect if there was just one current flood? I don't remember if I did that calculation. And also, the magnetic fields, you know, they they are notoriously difficult to measure 
in a well they're difficult to measure any by any way by anyone anytime just i dare you go get go get a magnetic field measure you can even get analog ones that were it's on, a, it's on like a triple you know those those gear sy systems that can spin any way because it's got a triple axis or whatever so you can have a little magnet on one of those so it points in the direction of the magnetic field and just get you just get any magnet of your choice and i dare you to try to map out the magnetic field of any magnet right it'll take you out it'll take you an hour you know, because magnetic fields, they're just hard to measure. And then out in space where they are a long way away from us, and it's very complicated, you have currents flowing this way and 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 this way. And you're trying to look at one particular thread in all of that and how you're measuring the magnetic field anyway. Oh, shoot, we're using polarization primarily. Maybe we'll use polarization. We'll try that. We'll try looking at polarization images. And those, you know, you've got all kinds of reasons things could be polarized, right? Some of those reasons being magnetic fields. And so you got all that complexity. It, you know, it, it, it would be kind of like trying to find a, I know maybe it wouldn't be the same. I was saying it might be kind of like looking for a vein in, in, a, in, a, in a hand, and you, but, but you have stuff going all over the place. You have veins and you have muscles and you have nerves. And how do you, how do you know which is which? And it's an indirect readout, too, which makes it even worse. It's not like we can even go up there and stick a probe in the middle of the stream or something exactly. like that. Exactly. It is so indirect, right? right. So, so I, think, yeah. I think we're essentially looking at the way, you said polarization, so the way that light is being affected by these fields, I guess, is the best hope. Yeah, that's, that's one of the main reasons, because the telescopes that we've built so far have, 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 um, have developed that technology pretty well, so we can actually make pretty reliable polarization measurements, right? And so you can work back different ways that magnetic fields would polarize light that's coming coming through them. And then we've all, the, the, the other magnetic field uh, measuring tool is um, what we use for the sun also, which is that splitting. What's that line? That met that line, is it the, uh, one of the emission lines? The hydrogen 21? Right. No. The, not the 21 uh, centimeter line? No, this is, this is a much more ordinary line uh, but if it's in the presence of a strong magnetic field, it'll split into two lines, one of those quantum effects. And so we can use that line splitting to measure the strength of the magnetic field on the sun. Uh, but once you try to apply that same thing beyond the sun, it's just so hard. It's, it, it's so hard to find clean enough sources and signals that, that really let you use that method uh, on a large scale. I'm going to ask a very simple question, but mm -hmm. what is a plasma? It, it, it can be a lot of things, which is part of why it's confusing to a lot of us. Uh, like we say there's solid liquids and gases and we have experience with those. Uh, and we, don't, we know that there can be different kinds of solids, right? Uh, we know there can be different kinds of liquids. Uh, and kind of everything in between too, right? Like amorphous gels and exactly. non-Newtonian yeah, yeah. fluids. And... Right, right. But our, our day to day is kind of simple. We have water that we drink and we have, you know, so, uh, but plasmas, there's like, you know, 12 basic, you know, kinds of plasma. It, it, there's, there's, there's doesn't really seem to be any upper limit for the energy of a plasma. So you, if you have a cold plasma, so, how do I put this? If, if you lived in the realm of plasma, if you and I were plasma beings, in that world of plasma, we would see, we'd experience the equivalent of liquid plasmas, of solid plasmas, of gaseous plasmas. So what is a plasma is, 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 is it's this whole other world where, where every, uh, everything exists again, but in a much finer, faster uh, form. On earth, we do have some experiences with plasma, a flame. If you just light a candle, you are, or, or a fireplace, whatever, you're looking at a plasma. And, and there's some, there's something, there's some reason why, or that's, there's some connection with why we're so endlessly fascinated by fireplaces, right? I don't know what it is, but it has something to do with the plasma nature of the fire. We are just so locked into it. Uh, lightning is a plasma also. Yeah, it actually, it blew my mind. I found this video when I was teaching this physics course a few years back uh, that was showing these huge, powerful magnets bending this flame around. I was just like, whoa, yeah, I, right. I had never thought of it that way before. But I guess yeah, there is charge well, separation and yeah. Yep, exactly, right. And so when you come, I'm kind of cycling back and I to the beginning of your question, what is a plasma? A physicist would say a plasma is a matter where the charges, the, the plus and minus charges, where the charges are separated. And, and free to behave independent 
from each other. That's that's like one of the primary definitions of what is a plasma. The, re the reason that I ask is because we spent quite a lot of time talking to Pierre-Marie Robitaille about his metallic hydrogen model of the sun. Yep. And yeah. something that when speaking to people that come from a more conventional perspective, you know, everybody's like, well, everybody knows the sun's a plasma. And the foundational aspect of Pierre's theory is the fact that you have a lattice within the sun that allows for the delocalization of electrons in such a way that it behaves as condensed matter. And I'm like, is there some way to have liquid metallic hydrogen with delocalized electrons flowing through a lattice be also a plasma? I believe he does concede that it is a type of plasma. Uh, but I'm like not sure. Michael I'm not sure if mo if that's like the the main if the mainstream concedes that that's a version of plasma. As well. Oh, I, I think he's saying there are transient interactions that allow it to have this transient lattice structure. But he Pierre does call it uh, some sort of plasma, and like Michael just said, there's like do I don't know a dozen or so different types of plasma. Um, it's a kind of a tragedy that he doesn't just come right out and 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 call it a plasma because I think that would uh, probably recruit more support within the academy it sounds uh, a lot less you know combative that way yeah so i guess the question here is like is, is so if, when you say that there can be a plasma that is a solid like lattice like how how solid are we talking does it maintain uh, is it possible to maintain some kind of persistent lattice structure within the solid type plasma or is it so ephemeral that it forms momentarily and then disappears the next moment because I, I like I think about this a lot inside of the sun, where obviously you can't really. It, it's hard to to imagine what is actually happening, but with the the sheer amount of material that is in there, I can imagine that there's basically an infinite number of configurations that the atoms can take that allows them to be in this lattice form, and so to to seem solid without being solid. Yeah, and you might be right on that. I I, I wanna I. I want to tread carefully anything I might say about Pierre Marie's models because there's he he's so great and his models are so well thought out. So I don't I don't I would I I, I will hesitate to try to comment directly on how it, we might merge with his. Uh, yeah, uh, but maybe to your uh, my, this might go to your question, which is that uh, like you can you, I don't know if you've seen any pictures from the sapphire reactor where, where we have the, the center sphere and then there's these structures that are just on the sphere, right? So they, they will stay there for as long as you want. Under certain conditions, they're permanent structures, so to speak, right? And so that's what I mean by, so if you were living in the plasma world, those structures would be hanging around for a long, long time at the plasma scales, right? So they would essentially be a solid. They're just there, they just stay there. Now it's a plasma solid in the sense that, you know, that the, the charges are flowing. The charges are flowing all over the place. They're free, they're moving, and so they're going into the solid, they're out of the solid. But it's kind of, you know, like on, in rivers, when you, when, you, when you watch the water go down and there'll be this like, um, a hump will go up over a rock or something like that. And that hump will just stay there. The hump doesn't move, but the river flows through the hump, right? So it's the same in the plasma world. You'll have structures which can persist forever, but but stu but ma uh, plasma is flowing th always flowing through them. Just kind of so that leads me to the next question, which is we we kind of did a deep dive on the on the the idea of a gaseous versus a liquid metallic hydrogen sun. And one of the things that we came across was the question of black body radiation. The sun has a perfect black body spectrum. And whenever you go into details about this, you end up at Kirchhoff's laws of thermal emission. And on Wikipedia, it says that Kirchhoff says that there's three conditions upon which you can get a black body spectrum. Um, the weird thing is, though, is that Kirchhoff never said that hot gases under pressure can produce a continuous thermal spectrum. Like, it's it's cited in Wikipedia. Despite what Wikipedia claims. Yeah, like, if you go if to you Wikipedia... go to Kirchhoff's original work, he doesn't say he, that. He never ever. says this. Like, you can't have... So, so it, was, it was amended somewhere, and that's not really the point. The point is, is that we have been searching for evidence of black body emission from plasmas. And I was wondering if over the course of your research, you had ever looked to see if this kind of standing plasma was capable of giving a black body I think emission. So he's talking about the atmosphere of the sun, not the necessary, the, the bulk of it, if I understand. Well, it's all the, it's all the, 
Same, I think. Yeah, it's all the same question. So what we what what we found and others have found too, because I've looked a lot in the in the literature for this. Um, so it, in in the usual plasma discharge chamber, you have you have those those very distinct discharge lines, like you know these these spikes, right? The spikes that you see, and and then and that, that's over here. And then on the other end, you're saying, yeah, what about the black body? Do they, do they ever come together? And, and what I've seen in our chamber and also, again, other people's work is that you can def, they definitely approach each other. So if you have um, your high, you know, uh, a mix of gases, nice, a nice healthy mix of gases in your chamber, and you, you put it under like low, not pretty low pressure and, uh, and not, an outra- not an outrageous amount of energy, you just see those spikes, those spiky lines, right? But if you increase the pressure in that chamber, and you crank up the uh, the energy going into that chamber. You de- you definitely see this smooth continuum start to grow, start to rise up out of the floor of those uh, of, of those that previous spiky thing, right? And that thing that rises up, that background that rises up, is is black body. So I I've seen it in our chamber and other people's work. It they arise, it, they do arise. They, they they can they can go into each other. Now in terms of how can can we can we take that what I just said and push the throttle all the way to the left and say that explains the spectrum of our sun of the surface of our sun? I don't know. I I, I have not, I haven't seen somebody ask that, and I don't have the mathematical chops to to tackle that question. Yeah, I think pressure broadening is a known phenomena. The question is really whether that curve is is does nobody's been able to really demonstrate, at least adequately that I've seen, that the pressure broadening fits a Planckian spectrum. That that was and that it corresponds to temperature, and that's kind of, right, and that's yeah. kind of the the question that that I'm yeah. after. And it's understandable that it's like a particularly niche question. That yeah, <laughs> let's get Pierre yeah, back exactly. on here. To talk yeah, about. exactly. It, it, uh, the the Sapphire team in particular, but also other people that we deal with sometimes, we really have backed off from this fixation on temperature, or at least how temperature is defined. Like we have, we have there's definitions for temperature, and uh, and, we, and we do this thing where we say, oh, this, it's, this, it's this black body, therefore it must be this temperature, and we can go to the forge, and we can say, yeah, let's make the iron 120 deg- 1,200 degrees, that's a temperature, right? And here's the black, it all fits together quite nicely. But as soon as you take this concept that we use on Earth, and you try to apply it to stars and magnetospheres, uh, you, it, I, I, I really doubt if it, if, if, if that metric can meaningfully be used. Mm-hmm. I we think have- that's Pierre's broader point too. To mm-hmm. be honest, uh, I think that's really what he's getting at. Go. I think that we can probably. Do you have more more plasma cosmology questions? Or uh, let's talk biophotonics. Let's. Yeah. Let's. So you. So you have this other arc that you do, which has little to do with with the Sapphire Project, which is about the crazy things that life does with light. How did you get? What What is this? And how did you get into it? Yeah. It, it go. It, it goes back. So when I was. Uh, so through college, I, I have my physics uh, degree, uh, but I took just as many biology courses as physics, but you had to say which you were. And I was like, fine, I'm a physicist. And then when I got to graduate school, I was working in a medical research laboratory. So I was working, we were working on medical questions. Uh, and then uh, I, was a, I was a physicist, right? And so I studied the physics curriculum. So I've always had this dual this equal love of physics and biology. And so uh, the, I spent a lot, I spent years studying how biological organisms transform. Like there's just this, this thing inherent in, like I have, I grew these uh, sunflowers this year and it's not the ones that have the one big flower at the head. They, there's flowers that come out all along the stalk. Uh, and, and you, you look at them and you're like, okay, you just, you just see the stalk and the leaf, stalk and the leaf, stalk and the leaf. And then the next day you come back and all of a sudden there's this little creature growing out of, out of that little elbow there that's going to be the next flower. And you're like, where did you come from? You came from nowhere. 
I cannot point to the space that you came from because you came out of nothing, right? <laughs> I just, I've always loved that sort of questions with, with living creatures, this ability to just, just change into something else. All flowers are like that. You're like, what, where did you come from, right? Uh, and so that, I did that for years. And then that, that actually brought, that's what brought me to the electric universe in the first place, because I was starting to apply the biological principles, principles of transformation or the, 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 the characteristics of biological transformation to astronomical settings. And the supernova is, is really kind of one of the primary examples we have in astronomy of a star that transforms. And the, the reigning paradigm of this dead universe that we live in is that the star explodes and dies, you know, it's over. And I was looking at supernova from the point of view of, of the biologist and being like, no, that's, that's not a dead star that I'm looking at. And if anything, I'm looking at something that is more alive and more, more elaborate and more, it's doing more now than it was doing before, right? This, the supernova is not the dead remnant. It is a new kind of being. It, it, it has transformed into a new kind of being. And so that's what led me ultimately, this was 10 years ago or 12 years ago, to uh, hook up with, meet up with some of the electric universe thinking, uh, which was very, very cool. So the light, you asked about light, and that really was, um, I think the, the, the piece you're referring to in particular, that was a pretty recent, I mean, in the last year, I've been reading papers on how light plays a role in, in biology. Uh, so that particular piece was was kind of, and, and I don't know how these things, like you were saying, Anastasia, about if you're if you're in one camp, you stick to the party line and you only research in the party line. And I think there's little doubt about why you might study a particular thing. Well, because your department told you to, or your boss told you to, or whatever, right? But then others of us, who knows where these things come from? It's like, oh, I want to read papers on the on the, how cells emit light. I don't know. I want to say one thing about the supernova uh, yeah. example, which I think is really fascinating that you mentioned there's probably something more going on. Uh, there's There was a project, I'm blanking on the name of it, it starts with a V, it's a big acronym, where they looked at photographic plates of the sky from 50 years ago and they looked at them today and they found mm -hmm. some thousands of stars were just missing. Um, and... As you probably realize, there's only been, I think, five supernovas recorded in the history of humanity. Um, and so it, I just thought that that's a really fascinating uh, correlative that sort of supports what, what, you're, what you're mentioning here. Um, if, we, if all of our stars were, were dying by supernova, we should uh, certainly expect um, quite a bit more flashes, it seems like. Oh, yeah. I, I left out of the story that only a very few... Uh, transform yeah and, and 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 supposedly it's because of gravity again gravity always gravity right uh so all hell newton yes exactly <laughs> exactly <laughs> and so come coming back to the light the bio light biology thing uh i do know that this has been part of a just a perception that i think a lot of us have that that living beings are giving off something, right? Where there, there is something that we're giving off, and it's kind, it's like light. It's light, it's light, like you know. But it is it? I, I, I didn't. I never knew if I like if I put, took a photoreceptor and put it up to my cheek, would it would it register as light? I don't know. So that was part of why I was looking into it as well. We have pretty good instruments these days. Maybe the, maybe there's been research into. Um, the light that's actually involved uh, in cellular processes and living. And then it was just kind of like, oh yeah, yeah, there's hundreds of studies, hundreds and hundreds of studies of people pointing these, uh, these Hamatsu photoreceptors at different parts of people. <laughs> that's great. It's very exciting. And, and what... you, you list a bunch of those in your blog. It's really mm -hmm. fascinating. I, I was surprised to see so many references to people yeah. actually getting this research funded. Mm -hmm. What were you going to say? I, well, yeah, I was gonna, I was going to reference the blog as well, where it's. I think that one of my favorite examples is the one where you had. Uh, it was a paper that showed that if you had two people in a room and there's some kind of standing oscillation that was developed between them by by an external field that was applied, and then you put them into yeah. different rooms, and then you illuminated one of them, that the other one in the other unilluminated room would then also begin to give off more of this biophotonic light. Yes.
<laughs> you you described it very clearly. Thank you. Yeah, that is that is a complete mystery. I mean, <laughs> it's one of the things where I think up to a poet that might be more obvious, maybe right. But to someone raised through the heart, raised up through the hard sciences, it just is this completely baffling. Like what? You know, say describe that again. <laughs> you know, what I, that? I have a really good friend who claims to see auras, and I always like you know, sort of abused him for this, but uh, now I feel kind of bad about it. It turns out, by the way, if anyone cares, it looks, it seems like humans are green, emit green light mostly. Is that correct? So some of the studies, yeah, that it was, it was a lot of green light, um, but it was, a, it was a very broad green light. So, you know, it's, it's a broad spectrum, which peaks somewhere in, in the greens. That was some of the studies definitely saw that, but other studies, you know, are not looking for the whole spectrum. They're just looking for particular wavelengths so uh, i think the truth is pretty complicated you know so uh at, at the very beginning of this uh the light of life which is on your substack which is michaelclarage.substack.com you talk about this 1920s russian scientist where he he was the one to discover the morphogenic field where he took the dividing root tip of an onion and pointed it along the length of another onion root and found that the place where he pointed the root tip then began to develop faster. And if he put something in between them, that it stopped the increase of division in the other root. Have people repeated this experiment? Because first of all, that's, that's an extraordinary discovery, right? That's, that's just, it shouldn't, it shouldn't happen. It's like there's no mechanism, like you were saying, there's absolutely no mechanism to explain why this is happening. There's no mechanism why two people in a room with a standing wave between them would continue to, to resonate. But the something that I'm painfully aware of is that the Soviets did have a tendency to do weird science that didn't always check out. Have people repeated this experiment? Do you know? I do not know. I do not know. It's something that you and I could do. That's, that's, uh, that's literally my second thought. I'm like, I have some onions. We should. Know, we, right? should we should. Yeah, because we're just, always looking for stunts, you know? Like, we're YouTubers. We need, we, yeah. we need, we need yeah, to get right. stunts. Yeah, right. Yeah. Next to your owl there or your pine cone, you could have the onion, and you could be monitoring the progress of the onion. I like that a lot, so yeah. The one addition to how you described it very well is that um, it's it, when you want to block the process, the thing that you use to block it has to block ultraviolet light. Mm -hmm. That if you just put glass or well, I forget what things. Anyway, he tried some things, and uh, it was only only if you blocked the ultraviolet light could could you stop that. Reaction. Yeah, it seems like controlling it really tightly is necessary because it could be like some chemical thing mm -hmm. in the air or something mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. Otherwise. So is this is this like a direction of research that you're interested in pursuing or it's something that has just struck your fancy as being this 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 gap in human understanding? Like, can you imagine a, a sapphire level project for morphogenic fields? Yeah, I, 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 I wish at some point in my future to create or be involved with an institute that would be studying that but many other things also uh, along these lines. And, uh, and so the, uh, on the one hand, sure, it can, I'm sure it can be developed, like for example, for medicine. I'm sure there are so many ailments that are baffling to us now that will just come into focus once we start looking at light and bio photons and how is light being used just Every day, ordinary every day. How 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 do our bodies use light to start processes, to stop processes, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera? I'm sh I'm, I'm I'm absolutely certain that a lot of mysterious illnesses will just totally make sense once we look at that. It, it seems me, like a natural next step for somebody like Michael Levin, uh, who we've also had on the show recently, to investigate in terms of regenerative medicine or communication within patterned communication. Uh, yeah, I mean, he's talking about electricity, and obviously, light is at least a half electrical phenomena. It it also immediately makes me kind of horrified as I sit in this room and we're talking about the effect of light on biology, and I look around at all of the radiating objects. 
right? Like there's a big light in front of us. There's computers. There's there's electronics. It just we're 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 suffused so constantly with this. And you say that there's you know the the mysterious illnesses that we have no direct provenance for. It seems so straightforward to sit down and say, well, perhaps there is something about the fact that we live surrounded by invisible pollution, right? Because people talk about, you know, radiation or PFAS or BPA or whatever else, but we're constantly bathed in the, the, the substance of a modern society. And there's, this is so far from even being discussed. You know, it's, it's the idea that, you know, 5G radiation might cause problems is the butt of the joke, yeah, it's just yeah, it shows you what uh, I what I, I try to get some of my students to not keep their cell phones right on their reproductive organs, uh, and so I try to explain to them the different ways that that could be a problem, you know. And uh, if you, it, the research started in the seventies, the the Navy, the Navy did their the primary research because they started to develop the radio systems, right? All these radar systems and radio and microwave and this and that. And they did their homework and they said, does this cause any problems? Yes, it causes all kinds of problems. The research was was clear from 19, you know, 71 on, right? It is, and yet somehow, you know, these days for any paper that gets published showing that it's a problem, the telecom industry will fund another group to publish a paper that shows just the opposite, that it's not a problem. So we're, we are in this really very confusing space. Uh, yeah, I think it usually comes down to like a power density argument. Um, I tried to like dig into this and read a blog myself a couple of years back when 5G was coming out and people were panicking. But it and, seemed- and it's really a very stupid argument, but somehow they were able to make that be the, the defining quantity to look at. So one, I, I don't know, I can't remember who did it, but somebody, so, you know, the, 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 the electrical things that surround us, they're not just microwave, they're pulsed microwave. So they're digital information transferring devices. So the microwave signal is being pulsed with the digital signal, right? And so that means that the electric and magnetic fields are going from zero to whatever their high value is back to zero. And it's going basically at random. I mean, if you take a, any signal and you convert it to digital, and you try to listen to the digital signal, it just sounds random. It's just awful, right? Uh, or they, like the modem, you we remember the modem sound when the modem's connecting, right? It's all just terrible stuff. Okay, so that pulse, when you have that pulse of microwaves that is transferring the information, that very steep rise in electromagnetic field can cause, or does just physically, it physically causes a low, very, very localized, very strong electric field gets created. When, when that, when that, when you, when, when the wave hits you, when the wave hits you and it goes from zero to, even if it's just, you know, uh, 0.1 milliwatts or something, right? It's gone from nothing to 0.1 milliwatts in, in, in a tiny fraction of a second. Someone put their, their fancy electrodes on a cell wall, into cell walls. It's amazing they can do these things now, right? And different gap junctions, different different in intracellular proteins. So just an ordinary cell with a bunch of stuff. Oh, they were looking at calcium channels. That was it. Calcium channels, sodium channels on cells. And then you 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 turn on the Wi-Fi and the pulse microwave starts and the the cha- the electric field is strong enough that it can activate the sodium channel the sodium channel is activated electrically ah. right uh and so it's like it's such a simple proof that it's not a, it's not the power density of the of the field that's that's necessarily the problem but it's what kind what's the strength of the randomized electric fields it creates in a cell and it creates a big enough randomized pulse that your so your your ion channels are opening and closing at random and your body, you better believe that cell is working overtime to compensate for that chaos that you've just introduced into its, uh, into its tightly regulated uh, homeostasis. Another piece to this puzzle is the work of Jackie Barton, who's at Caltech. And she, so this connects to the research that I was doing during my PhD, where I was looking at electrical communication bacteria. And what she studies is she studies the way that electricity is passed through strands of DNA. And she thinks that repair mechanisms are basically 
a functional on the basis of an interruption of the flow of current through the DNA strand. And so the way that... Uh, because it's it's a huge question. So you have all of this DNA that's densely packed away in chromatin and, and, and it's it's folded up. So then if you have a mutation of some kind, how does the repair mechanism know where to go? Is it is it just surveilling? And you, you made this really amazing parallel in one of your in one of your pieces, which is that if you were to take all of the DNA that's inside of your body and unwrap it, it would be basically on the scale of the human body. So you're telling me that these proteins are just they're able to surveil that that depth of DNA randomly and, and stumble yeah. upon the right thing? <laughs> no. They, yeah. So she's basically yeah. and we've I've tried I've I've hounded this woman. I have emailed her, I have called her office, I have left messages, she has not come on the show. I hope hope one day that she will, because it's really, really fascinating work that seems to suggest yeah. that there is an electrical nature to DNA in this yeah. very, very fundamental way that no one's looking at yet. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. Yeah. Are these morphogenic fields uh, comparable to those that are discussed by uh, Rupert Sheldrick? Are you guys friends or have you talked with him about this at all? I have not. I have not talked. We've met at a few conferences. Uh, he's a total hero of mine. At one of the conferences, I got to sit next to him on stage during the Q&A, and I was just like, I'm sitting next to Rupert Sheldrake. <laughs> uh, yeah. uh, I think that it undermined our credibility. It was hard to have uh, conversations with people working on the edges of science and be like, okay, so we're going to be alien puppets and we're going to do a puppet show while we talk to you about deep scientific questions. And no small number of people were like, um, reach out to me in, in six months or so. <laughs> oh boy. Yes. Uh, I was at the morphogenic field, so uh, from as as Rupert Sheldrake defines them, uh, I don't. From a, just my my take on his his ideas is that I don't think he would say that it's not these electrical and 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 light fields, right? But I, I think he would probably say that it's 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 much more. Also, it's much more than than just that, you know. Yeah, I was gonna try to maybe under maybe interrogate the physical mechanism underlying those interactions. But I guess that depends on us understanding a physical mechanism of light and electricity and really uh, kind of going beyond probably our present material-based understandings. Yeah, and, and, and the, oh, this, this was the thread I didn't, I wanted to answer with Anastasia's question about um, why I get into the light research at all is that it does it does bring us right up against thought feeling consciousness uh and um i uh, we we we, ha we have to the, the the next the next civilization <laughs> knock wood that we're heading into ha has to have has to incorporate those things into science like at this point Thought and feeling are just just accidents, right? Just these, oh, I don't know. It just just arises somehow. It's an evolutionary advantage, I guess. You know, so it just kind of around. And that that's so that to my mind, that's so wrong. It's just, it's almost completely inverted, right, from from what reality is. And so whatever science we're moving into towards has to has to put things like thought and feeling in into some kind of a cosmic ladder where it's not, where thought is not, you can't, I, I don't know if you can separate thought from matter. Apparently you can separate consciousness from matter. There's plenty of people who experience leaving their body uh, in one form or another, right? So, so you, you can separate something that we call consciousness or something from matter. Uh, but, but uh, so why study light at all is because there's somehow that is, that's like the meeting place. That's, that's the best we have. Things like light and electricity are the best toolbox, things in our toolbox that we have as currently educated scientists. That's the closest thing we have to what our thoughts and what our feelings and what is consciousness. I would, I would like to add to that, that I would like to see some near-death experience studies that are done in a near vacuum to see if there does need to be material there or not in order for the near-death experience to be carried out.
Well, I think what he's saying is kind of interesting, if, if I could clarify, is that light seems to be an activity of sorts. Electricity also is an activity. And the mind is is also in this space of it's not just, you know, it's not just a molecule doing something. And, and, uh, and that's basically the extent of our physical understanding of these processes. And so we're in this space of unknown activity happening. What is that all about? And I, I really do believe that we, we, we have emotions because we live in an, in an emotional universe. We, we wouldn't, we couldn't have emotions. We, if, if, if we didn't live in a world that was emotional. Uh, and again, I think the poets have understood this forever and maybe the scientists will come around eventually and same with thought. I mean, we, we, we can't have, this is my, so I, I think this is how the Greeks saw it too. If I, if I remember right, Plato correctly, some of them, the only reason you and I can think is because we live in a universe that has thoughts. It certainly follows the musical nature of the spheres and the, the resonance patterns. And if music is the ultimate artistic expression of emotion, or if it is just like a raw expression of emotion, then it certainly would follow that these, these resonant patterns that we see. I mean, it's kind of crazy. It's like several perfect fifths in our solar system in terms of orbital uh, comparisons. Oh, yeah. And, you know, we could basically build the Western scale out of fifths if we wanted to. So it's it's just it's you know it's it's all right there. Uh, it's, there's obviously drama playing out and out of left field question. What does this mean for astrology? <laughs> What's the what for it? I said, what does this mean for astrology? Oh well, I I studied astrology for a, a while until I understood what it, what I think it is back this is years and years ago, and um, I think. I would go back to what it said, what it meant 2000 years ago, which is that astrology for individual people is kind of meaningless. Uh, maybe a few people per generation have some meaningful astrology to them, like say great leaders, people who are pivotal for, for, for changes that have to take place in civilization. You know, it can often hinge on a couple of people or a small group of people. They might have astrology associated with them. But for the rest of us, for you and me, we are bathed in these influences that are, you bet they're causing changes on earth, big changes, changes that to us seem like ma mass changes that don't really, that we struggle to make any sense out of. Like, you know, just sort of we're talking about phones uh, earlier. Why are we all so fascinated with these freaking phones? I mean, if you had shown a phone to somebody 200 years ago, they probably wouldn't even care. They would just be like, ah, you know, it's a, it looks like a pain in the ass to me. I got to charge it. Oh, forget it. No, I'm not going to, you know, but not us. We're like, oh, I want that. I want two of those. I want everyone. To, you know, and, and so, so how did that arise that all of a sudden the whole, you know, country, the whole world wants these things. So that's, that to me is an example of astrology that these changes are, 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 you know, rolling over this, our consciousness, our awareness, our, our desires, our, what we think is important. Um, and those changes, some of those, some of the, some of the causes for those changes come from beyond the earth. I mean, they don't, not, not everything that happens on earth is, is cause, it has its primary, you know, cause from the earth, if that makes sense. What I'm saying. Yeah, it makes total sense because I think it's very fallacious to look at human beings as separate from nature. Like a very easy example I always give is you look out your window, see, look at a tree. If that tree wasn't there and all of its cousins, you wouldn't have anything to breathe. And so therefore you can't exist without that tree. Therefore it's, it's a real stretch to think of yourself as truly separate from it. And I think that we have to start looking at the earth in the same context. Could the earth exist without this solar system? Could the solar system exist without the other solar systems? And then really how, how much are we those systems at the end of the day? Mm -hmm. um, we've, we've been talking for a little bit more than an hour at this point, and we have some questions from our discord. Would, would would do you have enough time to 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 cover a couple lightning of them? Round. lightning round lightning round okay let's do it excellent okay so we're gonna start off with a really really simple one uh, what is energy hmm 
<laughs> I don't know. Um, we have, uh, like a lot of these things, we, 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 we have a very basic understanding of them from, from being alive in this world. So I think they're, 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 and that's a fine answer. So we all know what energy is, right? We all know when you have it and when you don't have it. We all know that it can burn things. Um, what science, what physicists have done in particular is create this catalog, this ever-growing catalog of different forms of energy. Like one of the classic ones is uh, like, oh, what was the name? Joule, Mr. Joule, a uh, scientist, I think he's British, uh, and he, he shows that if you agitate water, you can raise the temperature of the water, right? And he goes one step further and he, he hooks his agitating paddles up to two pulleys that have heavy, heavy weights on them. And he lets the weights drop, and which causes the paddles to move, which causes the temperature of the water to go up. So he has just connected this energy called lifting heavy pieces of metal, right? It takes energy to do that, it takes energy to lift up a heavy piece of metal. He has connected that to this other kind of energy, which we call heat, like heat and temperature, right? Now, you can see that it works, so you know it works. How that works exactly, you know, things get, pre things get pretty murky when you actually try to, like, pin it down and say, well, how does mechanical energy turn into temperature? Things get confusing really quickly. When you, and then, then we have things like chemical energy, where you can, instead of just agitating the water, maybe you can cause some chemical reaction to happen, which either absorbs or releases other forms of energy. So energy can take a lot of different forms, but I think at a fundamental level, we all know we all know what it is. Is it just motion? It, it, it can be motion. Is there any kind of energy that's not motion? Ooh. Or potential to be in motion. Or, well, that would be that would be potential energy. To be in motion. It sure. has the potential to yeah, be. Yeah, yeah. See, I think right, the, the, well, the current paradigm was certainly would would say that, yeah, it's all it, everything's moving. We you know nothing nothing ever is still. So Anything that's manifesting energy just is going to be moving. Yeah. Yeah, I think that that's kind of the paradigm that that we operate under because we we do a little bit of uh, we do a little we have a we have a channel where we do visualizations of atomic phenomena. And so in our Discord, people are always uh, where we have we have a, a channel that's dedicated to basically atomics. And, and we're attempting like my my PhD was essentially in material science. Um, in a biological perspective. So we're basically trying to provide material explanations for quantum phenomena. And so uh, we, we tend to define energy as material in motion or, or yeah. the potential to be in motion. I think that's yeah. what you're getting at. But I, I think that this, the way that you responded to it, I think, is intuitively the way that most people think about it, where they're like, I know what it is. Like, you know yeah. what it is. Everybody knows yeah. what it is. You have, there's Everybody. absolutely no, there's no question. But even that thing where you say, it's like, well, you feel it if you have it. And for me, it's like, that's almost a potential energy state, right? Where uh, the question is, do I have energy to go make dinner? And the question is, <laughs> do I have the will to get up and start moving? And it's always <laughs> that. And so I, I think that that's something that, that, you know, I, I'd love to see, I'd love to see that definition expanded because we basically we maintain a rolling list of definitions, and people come and they argue with us, and we we update them as we go. So if anybody wants to get on the question of definitions, come to our Discord. Yeah. Um, so Mike also has a different question that is a corollary to what is energy. He wants to know if you think that the universe is an open or closed system. The universe. It's hard because we don't know what the universe is. Uh, it's it's all quite, you know, you can imagine that it goes forever or you can imagine that it has a boundary. And if you if you sign on to certain cosmological stories, then, you know, it's either closed or whatever. So I don't know. I don't know if open or closed. And then if you said it was open, then it must be interacting with other universes maybe. So then is that larger system open or closed? I don't know. I don't think my my faculties can. can it seems like it. the word uni implies that it's everything, you know. So it's uh, almost closed by definition at that point. Well, because it would be everything that is, right? Yeah. 
So I would, I would agree with that. I mean, I, I do think about it sometimes if we're just basically the equivalent of a bacterial biofilm in some kind of Petri dish somewhere. Yeah. But that, I mean, when you study bacterial biofilms, you start seeing them everywhere. So it's hard to, <laughs> it's hard to see things differently. Um, something else that he wanted to know is the idea of, of entropy. And he asks if he, 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 and I'm not, I'm not exactly sure what the source of this is, but he says, what does it mean for entropy to evolve? And where might our ideas of entropy need to change to make better theories? Yeah, right. It's a lot in all that. Um, I don't know about uh, the entropy. I don't know what it means either, the entr entropy ev evolving. I mean, entropy, entropy can change, but I don't know if that's what the person means by evolving so that's, that's is he asking what it has to do with evolution of organisms perhaps i think that it might have something to do with evolution of organisms because obviously because humans are very far or we're, we're you know we're very far from uh, yeah so it's i think that it's asked in the context of self-organization like how do how do systems come to self-organize in a in a universe where entropy is deemed to increase yeah. in perpetuity know, right it's one of those obvious absurdities that somehow we go along. I, I was at one conference kind of going into this cop with somebody and the person's, I, so I'm gonna give my view on entropy soon, but this person had the other view of entropy, which is that it's, oh, it's always increasing. We know that, we, we know that now that entropy is always increasing, right? And so that, you know, and so he said, well, yeah, but a lo yes, life, he said, life, life has a very low entropy, but that just means that the entropy has to be increasing outside the earth. And I was just like, can you show me a single experiment that would even come close to verifying what you just said? You know, uh, yeah. So entropy is a, it's a definitely, my experience of it is it's definitely a very strong, I don't know if I'm going to call it a force, a tendency, a force. Um, and we, and again, it's something that we all know. We all know that struggle of keeping your house clean and working out your thoughts. Like you can have a jumble of thoughts and you can spend weeks trying to get them, get them, get them down to, to a, a, a clean structure, right? So we've all had that experience of fighting against entropy in various forms. And we know that it somehow just literally happens. Like if you turn your back, all of a sudden your house is a mess and you're like, how did that happen so fast? Um, and and where, where, what we, I think if entropy is gonna be part of our future science as a useful, uh, concept we have to bring it in with we we have to marry it with its 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 sister which is that <clears throat> there are things like thoughts and we were talking earlier about um not 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 was what we want we were saying that the planet wants to go well, not didn't have an agenda anyway there entropy lowers for reasons it doesn't lower for no reason and if as long as our science is ignoring that there are reasons for things and motiv motivations, as long as we ignore that, that, that we live in a universe that has a lot of motivations in it, we're never going to understand entropy. It's going to be always this mystery that has three definitions. Each one is stranger than the last, right? You, have you looked recently at the definitions of entropy? They are just like, boo, right? They're so wacky. They're so whacked out. Um, so that so that the uh, maybe just repeating what I was saying the the entropy is 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 we all know it, and a science that that uses it in the future is going to have to admit or acknowledge that there is this other force or tendency which you could call mind or intention or desire or goals or whatever that always is always going in the other direction. It's always lowering the entropy. And, and those two are in a constant balance. And you could, you know, if you broaden your time scale uh, far enough, I'm sure they're almost always equal, right? That every civilization that has ever gone up has always gone down. I guess it's getting kind of, I don't know if that order goes someplace. Okay, I'm off past my... Oh, I was thinking it, it's really fascinating. I've actually heard it expressed and I can't find who it was that I originally read this from. Uh, but... I've heard life defined as that which produces maximum entropy, which is really fascinating because that's the flip side of, of the coin, essentially. It's like, well, if you think about it, we're always, we're, like you were said at the beginning of, uh, of the conversation, we're always tearing things apart. Our metabolism's always ripping stuff up. We need fuel. We give off waste. And we're creating all this chaos in our wake, right? So if you just define entropy as disorder, 
while life forms do a great job of uh you know leaving quite a disordered footprint from where they came uh, you're taking like very because i mean i studied metabolism in grad school and when you look at the metabolic process that happens inside of a cell right when you take a sugar and the way that it's a machine that just basically strips that sugar down to water and carbon dioxide and then you realize that it does the same thing for proteins it does the same thing for fatty acids and and then you look at bacteria and you're like wow they're doing it for rocks they're doing it for all kinds of crazy hydrocarbons and they're just systematically snipping the smallest possible piece off and then discarding it they're like well, i don't need this anymore i don't need this anymore i don't need this anymore but the it seems like the the breaking is what brings life joy almost like that is that is the like life wants to take something that is really really structured and just crack it and just be like oh it feels it's like bubble it's like popping bubble wrap like popping bubble wrap <laughs> <laughs> like that is that is the that is that is that's why we like to pop bubble wrap yeah. i've just i've decided it's yeah. the or you take a kid out in the woods or something they just start ripping the leaves off trees and <laughs> exactly. just, just leave a kid in a room with some fragile stuff for an hour it's like yes. it won't be there when you yeah. get back you oh know? man we were working as so when we left grad school there was this we left like bats out of hell we we left new york city we moved into a car for four months. Our car was a CRV. So we lived in the back of a CRV for four months and we had stupidly built the bed in the back of it in such a way that you could A, neither sit up in bed, so it felt like you were kind of like yeah. sliding into a coffin every night, nor yeah. could you lean the front seats back all the way. So you were basically just kind of like uh, hunched forward for four months. And then finally at some point we were like, we have to stop. Like this is insane. We're we're going to we're gonna self immolate. The trip ends here. <laughs> the trip ends here. We landed in Oregon because Oregon didn't have a requirement for substitute teachers. We were like, this is you know we, we're we're educated. We have the we have the credentials to be able to get a certificate. Yeah. We're gonna substitute teach. Also had a lot more trees in New York City. Also had a lot more trees in New York City. But something that I found was that a room full of students seems to just generate these little tiny pieces of paper like <laughs> you, you yeah. like, like after a day yes. of classes you look around and it's like i used to work with mice and you in order to satisfy the mice for them to produce bedding you put them into a cage and then you give them this cardboard that they like rip yeah. up and then they like make yeah. a nest out of and it was the exact same thing in the classroom law of yeah. maximum entropy production yeah. right there Oh gosh! Oh, absolutely. Uh, the the entropy example that I'm coming to me is um, so when I was in graduate school, like a lot of people, we were uh, I worked for a while on the the uh, you ever the, it's called cellular automa where you automata automata where you make a computer program and in, inside the computer world you have little things that have rules that have rules about whether or not they propagate or merge or whatever you can and you can and there was this game called the game of life that somebody made back in the 80s or 90s or something like that and so me and my buddy worked on creating this little world with little cell cellular automa little xyz grid and then rules about what would make the, the the individual blobby things live or die or eat each other whatever worked on it for weeks it you know it took so much effort to get it going Things get, you know, all this stuff, all this problem, weeks and weeks of work. It was all just fun, fun stuff, right? And finally we got it going and it was running. It was like, oh, wow, look at it go. And he turned to me and he said, this proves that you don't need mind or God or anything. This proves that that life can just happen randomly from, from molecules banging into each other. Because look at look at our little world that we do that here. And I was so, that struck me so much because I had come to exactly the opposite conclusion from the entire adventure. I was like, two smart people just spent two weeks laboring over this and tr trying again and again and again and again and again. And finally we get something that kind of works. And so we've just proved the opposite, that stuff like life all will only come about with enormous effort from some very much higher intelligences than, you know, than are manifesting inside the little world. That's that that is a fascinating thing that I think encapsulates why I love science so much mm -hmm. because you can have a you can have a set of data, right? Amount of time it takes to make the computer program, the blood, sweat and tears that go into it, the the final outcome and you can have two people look at the exact same set of data and come up with just absolutely yeah. opposite conclusions. And yeah. you know, in 
And I don't, there's no answer to that, right? Because it's just this personal preference for what you think it means in the world. And it's, it's, yeah. and it's kind of this bottomless endeavor that I really, right. really have always loved. Yeah. Yeah. What's, what's your thoughts on whether, I get into this argument with people sometimes, whether or not a scientist or science has any moral compass Man, that's a really important question for this moment in society. Um, I think that it boils down to a fundamental misconception about the separation of technology and science. Because the way that we see science, it's all about understanding what's happening in nature and trying to approach as close of an objective understanding as possible. Whereas technology always has a motivation to it. And, and, and honestly... The, f the way the educational systems are set up and the funding situations, there ain't a lot of money for science as I'm defining it. There's a lot of fuel to make stuff happen and particularly make stuff that can drive a, a reasonable profit margin. Um, but that's industrious and that's, you know, I'm not faulting that uh, industry uh, per se, but it's fascinating that the separation has confused our ability to separate out uh, the objectivity of science from what we aim to do with it. And, and, and the more that gets blurred, the, the less likely it is that we're going to be able to make objective decisions based on scientific understanding. We're going to make decisions based on technological understanding, which is what's kind of happening right now. And that gets into a, a really weird gray area where we can't we can't objectively analyze something from a moral standpoint because it's like too wound up in what we're trying to do with it fundamentally. I I also want to add to that that I think that oftentimes the, the curiosity becomes its own god in many ways for scientists, where you have people that are naturally inclined to pursue understanding, right? You become a scientist because you're curious about how things work. And then one fine day you find yourself, you know, waist deep in rat corpses and you're pulverizing their brains because you're looking for some protein that you need to be able to isolate in sufficient quantities. And there is a reluctance to take a step back and to be like, is it worth it? Because on some level, since you have attached it to this flywheel of progress, it is worth it. Because if you discover the functionality of this protein, maybe you'll be able to cure childhood leukemia and you'll be able to release untold amounts of suffering. But then you have people who are, you know, psychologists that are working for places like Facebook or they work for the CIA in order to figure out what it's like to break somebody's brain down to be completely reprogrammed. And on one level, you can make the argument, well, if we didn't figure it out, somebody else would figure it out and they'd use it against us. And so we have to figure it out. And I think that oftentimes people separate their morality from the pursuit of curiosity because it is far too complicated and it leads you in many ways to this kind of almost Luddite level of thinking. Because if you're, if you're thinking about stars and galactic stuff and otherworldly things, I think you don't have to wrestle with morality the same way that you do when you are asking, well, what is this soft, squishy thing doing inside of somebody else's brain? And yeah. that's not a thing that we have any idea of how to deal with because you, on one hand, want to help people. And on the other hand, you have to break some line of sanctity in order to do so. And I don't want to go back to the Renaissance where it's just like, well, we can't cut up bodies because we're going we're, we're gonna to break the yeah. sanctity of life. But yeah. I, I, don't, I don't really, I don't, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> All that to say, I don't know. Yeah. What do you think? Okay. I wrestle with it. I, 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 I do feel somewhere deeply in me that s science with a capital S uh, absolutely can help me discover or it, it can help me with morality. And it absolutely can help me with uh, like finding the purpose of my life or of your life or of any life in, in general, right? That, 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 that it is, it's not something that is just like you know, I don't know the word to use. So I feel that, I know that, but it's so hard. I mean, we, we don't really have science with a capital S much 
sometimes we, re we reach that level as a species, but usually not. And we certainly we don't have it going on now, uh, you know, in our what we call science now. Um, yeah. So like I'm, as I'm a sacred about. practice, there's something which has some sort of like, rever which we have some reverence and esteem for like that. Yeah, right. Yeah, and so somebody who might say, "Oh no, you know, a scientist would would be independent, would be isolated from reverence, and would be somehow immune to you know," and I'm like, "No, just the opposite, right? That's or at least that's why I'm in the science game. I'm not in the science game to somehow insulate myself from reverence and from awe and from uh, you know being on my knees regularly, right? That that that's not that's not the version of science that I somehow am pursuing." It's funny because it is really the technologists that we talk to that claim the fifth when it comes to discussions like this. They're like, well, I just want to build stuff. Like, I don't have to worry about that stuff. Like, somebody else can worry about it. Maybe the scientists or somebody who, who studies basic nature can worry about it. But, you know, I, I should just be allowed to build my neural shanks or whatever it is, you know. Yeah, this is a particularly close to home thing because when I was in grad school, I worked in a laboratory that was developing neural shanks for recording and controlling neuronal signals. Oh, oh. And it was just always a thing where I'm like, guys, have we thought about the ethical implications of this? And people yeah. would just, they treated me like I was an idiot for asking. Yeah. <laughs> like straight up. I mean, like, gr granted, I was not, I was not a particularly, you know, expert electrical engineer in any way, shape or form. So I definitely was like low on the totem pole there. And so I think that it made it easier to dismiss because they're like, oh, the biologist is asking about ethics. But yeah, right. there was no real, there was no real consideration of it. But I think that your vision of, of what science can be is, is very beautiful. I think it's possible too for scientists to conference and come into these understandings as a community too. I know there was at the uh, inception of cloning technology, there was uh, something of a moratorium on the technology until the scientists could agree on how and under what conditions they would be implementing it. So, you know, I haven't seen any of that for CRISPR-Cas or anything, but it is it is within the bounds of history, and it, it seems possible that we could get together as a community and make some ground rules. But I don't know. Are there any other questions that were particularly interesting that we might want to... Um, let's see. So we have... There's two questions that are a little bit... I, I, wanna, I don't want to say that they are out there, but they are perhaps, they're more apocalyptic than I'm used to thinking. So let's see. Don't get us in trouble. The, Don't well, get us in trouble. We'll, we'll, we'll save it. Into, so right now we, um, what he's, what, what Shiloh is talking about is that uh, we released a conversation recently with Dr. Don't say, don't say, don't. With, <clears throat> with, with a person who uh, is a persona non grata on YouTube. And so wow. we're under an extended community strike for 90 days where if we publish anything... Wait, we just can't say any trigger words. Yeah, if we say any trigger words or we say anything that might um, trip the filters, we'll get a longer punishment where we can't publish anything for like two weeks and then we'll be blacklisted. It's we like, didn't even like... It wasn't even like an illicit conversation either. We just happened to mention a couple of words that are no-nos on yeah. YouTube. So I, I want to avoid... To tell, you, to tell along those lines once, once we're through with this thread. So... Uh, does that mean we're going to read the apocalyptic question? <laughs> yes, yeah, yes, can, I'm going to... Can I'm, you say it without saying Yes, the, yes, I have. Okay, so the first one is, um, do you... So this this comes from Chris, and he's asking if you think that it's going to be possible to repair um, mutagenesis on the total genome fast enough to beat extinction from chemical pollution. This is a pretty straight... This Ooh. is... Uh, yeah, I could easily imagine some some future, yeah, where that... Is is a is a technol is technologically possible? Sure, yeah. Do do you think that so? Can I kind of asked this in a pre-show when we were talking? But if you're working on the ability to transmute elements, does it also relate back to this idea of being able to transmute biological compounds? So it's like, can you imagine a way of applying what you know to be able to fix? Mutations. I mean, biology is a squishy thing that's very hard to wrangle. Yeah, yeah. I, to that specific question, no, I, 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 I don't see the connection. Not right. to say it's not there, but yeah, I just don't. That's fair. Um, and so then the other question is: if we are contaminated with technology 
that alters the intracellular electromagnetic behavior mm -hmm. of the cells. And then we have some kind of, and he also points out the fact that we're living on a system of lithium ion and capacitor-based energy storage that is particularly flammable and susceptible to various like EM radiation events. So our bodies are contaminated with these, with these high energy compounds. We live in a world where we're surrounded by devices that will, you know, at moment's notice explode. What, what's going to happen if there is a Carrington type event? now yeah. in the present day oh boy yeah you know i i don't really i haven't looked at it myself but i've talked to plenty of people who have asked that question along those lines and worked out some of the details um and uh it's all very grim i mean when you when you start working out numbers uh in terms of like our technology yeah it's all gone all the technology is just gone all the electronic technology and in terms of our cells um, is, the, is, the, is the question include what might a Carrington event do to our, elect, our, our biological electromagnetic nature? Our biological electromagnetic nature that has that is contaminated by modern oh, industrial processes, right? Right? Oh, right? right, right, right. Woo! Yeah, that's a great. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, life is so is so so incredibly intelligent and, re and resilient that. Our, our systems are fighting, so to speak, to neutralize the effects of all these things that we're surrounded by, right? It's it, it, no different than if we were in, um, you know, polluted air, which we are, or if we were eating polluted food, which we are, you know, it's it, the, the, the living system will expend an enormous amount of energy and intelligence uh, to, to, to keep healthy, to, 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 to work out those problems. And so if we, if a Carrington level event happens, I don't know. I mean, I, I tend to think that if, if the solar system is a whole, as we were talking earlier, if it's a if it's a unit, if it's a if it's a a, communi a, a system that communicates among its parts and it's all somehow holding together into a something, I would think that that that, that might imply that a character level event would maybe wipe out all of our cell phones, but would not wipe out all of the living creatures. It just it wouldn't it wouldn't work that way. Because the, the the whole system is just too healthy. It's too it's too coherent. It has too much built-in resilience to it, right? So it's not going to destroy itself, right? Water is a great insulator too. It's worth mentioning. Mm -hmm. um, oh, and we're, you yeah. know, as we know, we're mostly water. And I mean, not even not even just us, but we were we were trying to record something where we were sitting by a river, and we have these uh, lav mics that are um, they're RF microphones. They're RF so. microphones. And at some point, I realized that the interference from the river was so significant that they wouldn't work past a distance of like two feet apart from each other, like receiver and transmitter. Holy cow. It was, it was, it was. Don't try to film by a river, folks. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Or use wired wow. microphones if you do. It was really. Wow, that is so cool. I it love was really it. something else. Yeah. There's yeah. also this other strange aspect. We asked somebody about at NASA, I can't remember who, about the Carrington level events and, um, they were like, you know, we have plans for that. And the basic plans are to shut down the power grids, like on a huge global scale. And uh, I don't know if that's more terrifying than getting my cell phone blown up or, or, or what, but uh, it, it doesn't seem like there's, there's much in the way of productive solutions other than just pulling the plug just on turn the it off. Yeah. I exactly. imagine somebody no, pulling a comically large, like 10 people <laughs> having to pull like a comically <laughs> large plug out of the wall. <laughs> yeah. Um, so then, you know, to close, I have I have one question that I think might be bigger than we can do right now, which I I want to perhaps lead us into another conversation that we can have at, at a different day. Okay. What do you think people get wrong about the contemporary model of the atom? Oh wow! Yeah. Yeah. Whew. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the, the the short answer for now, and then it's a great. It would be a great starting point for a future conversation. Is um, is is the nucleus, the role of the nucleus? What's going on with the nucleus? Because even you know, even even with quantum mechanics, it's mostly a science that was developed for the electrons, largely, right? And uh, so the nature of the nucleus is is mysterious to us still, and plenty of plenty of very uh, efficient practical, smart people will tell you, you don't need to care about the nucleus, that you can do all your physics and all your technologies 
and you you just pretend the nucleus is just a charge that has eight pluses on it, right? It's all that's all you need to know. And I think that really is uh, that attitude has a uh, or whatever that approach it has has really put up a huge wall in terms of our our next step in terms of understanding the model of the atom. That's fantastic. Do you know Do you know the work of Dewey B. Larson? Maybe. He wrote he wrote a uh, he wrote something called the case against the nuclear atom which we're we're starting to go into a series about because he died in the 1990s I think and so there's he obviously can't interview him but there's a lot of people that are very particular to his work and so we're trying to kind of go in that direction to explore these these alternate theories and so perhaps perhaps we can have you back in context of that as 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 a as a parallel thought Do you thought. know um uh, Edo Call K A A L. He he is a I forget which of which of our Nordic countries he's in Norway something. Uh, sorry, Ido. Uh, but he has a structure a new a, a, a model of the atom of the nucleus it's called the structured atomic model. But it's really of the nucleus. And he would be great to have as part of that discussion because he knows m- more about nuclear models probably than anybody you know uh he studied them all and he, he it, so that, that i'm just throwing it out it could be an interesting uh to either bring him in or maybe you would maybe you would just interview him even and just uh talk about his his idea of uh, the nucleus yeah that would be fantastic cool yeah we'll reach out yeah and well i mean i think that we should leave it there There's, this was a fantastic conversation it was it was a real joy to, to hear your perspectives yeah. Yeah, real pleasure. Thank you. I, I, of course, was nervous because I don't usually do this. I told you I don't usually do this format. Right. And so all today I was just imagining all these horrible ways it would turn out. <laughs> all the stupid things I would say, you know, and you two, but you two have made it a, a, a delight. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> Thank you yeah. so much. We, we try to have fun here. And so people can find you on your Substack, stack, uh, michaelclarage.substack.com. Where else can they find you? That's the main place. Uh, the, there's the work of the, the Sapphire team. Uh, we have a the corporate website is Orion A U R E O N. Orion's the name of the company. So they can also go there to keep up with the Sapphire work. Fantastic. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Clarence. It's All been right. really fun. Thank you very much. Yeah. Take care.